This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek, and I'm with Mary Jane Galviso, who is a longtime organizer of agriculture workers, Filipino agriculture workers. And uh, we're going to be talking about the history of agriculture workers in California and the struggles that they've been engaged in and the struggles today for agriculture workers. So welcome to Workweek. Thank you for having me. Um, I want to show you my t-shirt. It's the Filipino Farmers Cooperative, and we are located in the California Central Valley in Tulare County. And I start with that because it tells you a lot about the Filipino labor leadership and that it was always a collective one, um, unlike what we, uh, what we regard uh, uh, we think of now when we think about uh, uh, agricultural workers. Um, we think basically of Chavez, we think of Huerta, we think of these individuals <coughs> okay. and not of collective leadership. Well, maybe you can talk about the early history and post war of uh, agricultural workers in California, Filipino agricultural workers. That was a very, very important. I mean, that came out of, uh, um, you know, very militant and continuous organizing among agricultural workers, particularly Filipinos. And consider that um, as a colonial workforce, uh, there were uh, hundreds and thousands of Filipinos that were brought over from the, from the Philippine colony. And they included uh, my family, uh, starting to uh, work through the Hawaiian pl plantations and then being brought to the Alaskan canneries and to the West Coast for the green crops. But what's interesting uh, about that, um, of how, agri how the agricultural sector in this country used colonial labor was because it's it's there's a lot of relevance to what uh, what is happening now when filipinos were in in hawaii um of course um it they came as families and uh they lived on the plantations as families but that was all broken up when um agricultural in the uh, agribusiness needed um uh, more workers to come to the West Coast and to the Alaskan canneries. And so various laws were passed, and that meant only the single single men uh, were allowed to uh, to come uh, to immigrate here. Well, they were. It was a colony of the United States in 1889. They invaded the Philippines to supposedly bring democracy exactly. to the Philippines. And right. why weren't they able to bring their families to this country since they were a colony of the United States? Well, they were. To the Hawaiian plantations, they were allowed. Yet. But to the West Coast, and this is an interesting thing about what agriculture has done, and it's been, it's been the history of this country in terms of agriculture, uh, is, um, is one of the uh, hallmarks is that they do break up families. So beginning in the late uh, 1930s, and... Uh, uh, when the United States said that it was going to give nominal uh, independence to the Philippines, it was on the condition that all all um, all women, children, um, uh, uh, and older people would return to the Philippines. Now, this was called a Repatriation Act. In in fact, it was a mass deportation, and uh, a lot of my family were returned, and only the young men were allowed to stay and to and to uh, immigrate to the West Coast, um, and that was the first. Uh, that was the breakup. Now, people ask, well, why would they do that? And a lot of people just fall on the argument it was racism. Uh, that's a very superficial understanding of how capitalism works. Agriculture. Uh, is seasonal work, and by seasonal, you need to follow the crops. Uh, they don't need men who have wives and children to hold them down. The agricultural sector needs and always needs a mobile workforce, a workforce that can go, um, you know, to the Alaskan canneries during the season, go down to the Yakima, um, Yakima in Washington, uh, to do their crops and come on down to the West Coast and throughout the Southwest, 
right? That is the reason why agriculture breaks up families. So when you look at what's happening in the U.S.-Mexican border now, it's the same phenomena. The U.S. is breaking up Mexican and Latino families because they don't need families as part of the workforce. They only need the able-bodied right, that can pick the crops wherever those crops uh, are coming into harvest. And that is the reason. I know a lot of people advance the argument, oh, it's just racism against uh, Latinos and Mexicanos. Uh, no, it goes into the economics of how capitalism works, particularly in our agricultural sector. Um, so uh, in the in the late twenties, actually even earlier, uh, Filipinos were brought in as as a colonial workforce, and um, you know my uncle always described that time as you know life was cheap, and and uh, that meant that you had absolutely um, no uh, no grounds to negotiate your terms of work with the employers, especially with the, the big plantation workers. It took decades and it took a pretty united uh, workforce um, on the plantations to finally bring the big five, as they were called, the big five, uh, which at that time was companies like Del Monte, United Fruit, um, these companies to, um, uh, to agree to some of the basic reformist um, demands that the uh, plantation workers. But you know, when I moved uh, there to Hawaii in the 1980s, I remember one of the biggest billboards you used to see all over was uh, uh, Hawaii, um, uh, uh, plant uh, agriculture workers, the highest paid in the world, the highest paid agricultural workers in the world was in Hawaii. Within, I'd say, a decade uh, all the sugar, all the sugar pineapple plantations were pulling out. They were closing down, and uh, because it, it, they don't want to pay the highest wages in the world, so they moved. Interestingly enough, they moved to places like Thailand, of course, to the southern part of the Philippines, to Costa Rica, to Honduras, and that's where we get our pineapples and sugar cane now, right? Um, so uh, the the building, uh, this is another important uh, factor to understand about what this colonial workforce did, was that it took the U.S. agricultural sector from basically a simple farming economy to a corporate economy. In other words, it, um, it allowed capitalism in the agricultural sector to... Um, to really go into a period of monopolization. So it drove out family farmers. And, and even white farmers will tell you to this day that the USDA policy is like, uh, we don't, you know, uh, try to get white people out of the rural areas, right? Really, because what they wanted is not uh, produce from small farms, but from the new plantations. And uh, that's why I totally and completely uh, disagree with the term farm worker. There is no one working on a farm today. <laughs> There's no farms left, basically, right? I, I would say that 98% or 95% of all the agriculture, uh, the agricultural sector now is under, uh, is under uh, agribusiness, is well, under capitalist control. Well, in the 1930s, there were communists that were organizing in the Central Valley, uh, they were uh, tax police um, with the owners uh, tried to stop them from organizing. What, what was happening in the 1930s? Well, I think it was just the general upheaval during that time coming through the Depression. And this, this, is, this really shows you the true nature of, of, of capitalism. They're bringing in this huge workforce of Filipino uh, workers at a time when... Uh, whites and blacks and, you know, um, uh, others who, who composed the agricultural uh, workforce at that time uh, were not getting uh, work. And uh, so it was a great way that agribusiness began to pit, right, uh, it, which they still do, uh, immigrant, immigrant workers uh, against the uh, native-born. And... Uh, 
but slowly but surely, uh, capitalism uh, did make that change. They pushed out, uh, you know, uh, mo I mean, you won't find many black workers anymore. You won't find many white workers working in agriculture anymore. They successfully pushed them towards the city. And there was a deportation by Roosevelt uh, to Mexico. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. In the middle of the Depression. Right. Yeah, I mean, deportations were happening uh, as they happen now, right? Uh, it's a way to control the labor force. Uh, they want people uh, that understand that their terms, that you're going to be here just to make the money uh, for <laughs> for your boss, right? And when we don't need you, when the season is over, well, we're going to just throw you uh, throw you back to your country. That was basically it. The thing with Filipinos is that they couldn't do that. I mean, to throw. I mean, it wasn't just you know walk to the border and you just cross. I mean, that's uh, that's thousands and thousands of miles away, right? So they meant to make uh, the Filipino colonial workforce a permanent. Uh, workforce within the U.S. agricultural sector. And uh, when you look at it, um, you begin to understand the significance, uh, the significant role that Filipinos played in transforming the U.S. agricultural sector, like I said, from a simple farming economy to one that we see today where it is, you know, it is agribusiness. It is, uh, like they say, the factories in the sun. They thoroughly ca uh, um, um, industrialized, as they say, uh, agriculture uh, in this country. And they use the Hawaiian plantation economy, their system, as, as, a, as, a, as a, their prototype, you know, um, um, uh, so that's an that's an interesting thing, and that's why I like I said this whole term farm worker doesn't speak to the reality of agricultural workers today. Now let's face it, 98 percent of all agricultural workers in this country do not belong to any type of organization that fights for its rights. And let's talk about the strikes that were going on because um, this struggle in California, particularly. Uh, there was organizing efforts made, and they were uh, met tremendous repression. And uh, Larry Leong and some of the Filipino farm workers that came to the United States uh, were trying to organize. Why don't you talk about your experiences, the early history of organizing um, that you know about? Well, I can only uh, speak to, um, like I said, what I've read, but what I do know. And I do know that... Filipinos, when they came in contact with the general left movement in this country, and very clearly the Communist Party in this country during the 20s and 30s, is when they received the training, they received uh, that Marxist theory that allowed them to understand class struggle in this country, what their role was, and what what and uh, what the struggle. Uh, uh, the nature of the struggle, okay? So um, they understood it very clearly on, uh, on the Hawaiian plantations. As you know, the ILWU uh, was really um, the most important uh, force in organizing the Hawaiian plantations. Um, and Jack Hall to this day is, <laughs> you know, I mean, he remains a real working class hero among uh, anyone who lived on the plantation there. If you say Jack Hall, you know the ILWU. In fact, I had a really interesting um, um, encounter once with Bill Bailey, uh, and uh, he was there in, in Honolulu for, uh, for the ILW um, annual convention, international convention, and uh, he was telling me about his experiences because he could speak a few words of Ilocano. And I was surprised. I said, well, where did you learn that? He says, well, I, you know, helped to build, um, you know, to bring the Filipinos into the ILW, into the union. And I said, well, how did you do that? He says, well, I was a mariner. So um, we were sent on the ships. And the ships would uh, get to Manila and, uh, you know, uh, load up with all the Filipinos that were going to go work on the plantations. And he said, my job and the job of the others, <laughs> right, was to make sure that they signed their <laughs> signed up. And he said, uh, so he said on that ship that I was on, by the time we got to Honolulu, uh, Aloha Towers, 
every Filipino that walked off that ship went straight to the ILW Hall instead of to the plantation, and they were union members from the day that they began working on the plantation. He said, that's how successful we were, but it, take that, it took that type of organizing. So, uh, during the 20s and 30s, like I said, that, there were tremendous, tremendous uh, strikes, upheaval throughout the agricultural sector. And the Filipino labor leadership was in the forefront of it, from the canneries in Alaska, uh, green crops throughout the Southwest and the West Coast. And in Hawaii, there were massacres of Filipino organizers. Yes, and yes, and it was unfortunate. It was, it was a, a manipulation by the plantation uh, owners. They pitted, they brought Filipinos from different parts of the Philippines and, um, you know, instigated the divide and conquer uh, tactics. Uh, they used Ilocanos against uh, Visayans and, and, and uh, vice versa. And, you know, it, it's always the same. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a shot gets fired, someone gets killed, you're not sure where the shot came from, uh, that type of thing, but uh, it's always it's always about the armed um, uh, the armed presence of the plantation owners, the the police, the um, you know that come in every time that there's a strike. You know you're going to expect the police uh, to come in, and and that's what happened, right? The Hanapepe uh, massacre. But here on the West Coast, like I said, uh, the capitalists used a lot of different uh, ways to terrorize and to beat down the workers every time they went on strike. Um, uh, one of the main things, of course, is that, uh, you know, I, uh, my farm is in Tulare County, and there's, and, um, and all, when I was growing up, uh, we all knew that there was segregation. I mean, the railroad line, uh, the railroad uh, was uh, the line. Okay, any anything west uh, was uh, any it was was where we <laughs> was where we stayed where we lived. Anything east of the railroad tracks that was white. That was the white part of town. Uh, you dare not stay there after dark. And these were sundown towns, right? And uh, Exeter, one of the towns, is known. I mean, every time you said the word Exeter to older Filipinos, they immediately associated the anti-Filipino riots that took place, the beatings. And, um, and when were those riots? Uh, those were in the 30s. Those are in the 30s. Because what they did, and, and uh, uh, the growers and uh, purposely hired Filipinos to displace white workers to increase the racial tension and, uh, and the hatred between, uh, the hatred of whites against Filipinos, right? They intentionally did that, right? Um, and so... Um, uh, but I mean, it was done everywhere. If you if you still go down, like the town I was born in in Brawley, uh, you know, the railroad track on one side, it was kind of like Chinatown. Uh, the Chinese were were basically what anchored uh, most of uh, most of the non-white communities, right on the east. Uh, they had the restaurants, they had the cafes, they had the gambling halls. Uh, you know, it was all on basically one street along uh, along the railroad tracks where the packing houses houses were, uh, right, where the shipping was, uh, 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 the canneries were. And um, you can, you know, a lot of a lot of that is being destroyed. You look at Fresno and towns like Reedley, Delano, they purposely, I mean, destroyed the Chinatowns because it was a real a reflection of the segregation um, uh, in California and particularly in uh, uh, of what the labor of the agricultural workforce was. And the ILWU, as you were saying, in Hawaii and uh, in the West Coast was involved in not just organizing warehouse and longshore, but also helping to organize farm workers. Uh, one of those people was Howard Keeler, who's an ILWU Local 10 member. Why don't you talk about him and what he tried to do and did in, in the Central Valley? Well, um, I met Howard when, um, I think he was at the ILW Local 10 Hall, when he came up to me and he really he shocked me when he said that he knew Eat Leong. I said, oh my gosh, how, how would you have known Eat Leong? He said, well, I was his contact. 
through the Communist Party. Through the this is Larry Idley Young. Right. Uh, Howard Keeler and uh, uh, Larry Idley Young uh, were comrades. They knew each other. Uh, they met each other. And in fact, Howard shared that... Uh, that he met him on the strike line of the uh, 48 uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, asparagus strike in Fres in uh, Stockton, uh, and he said, "I was a, I was a college kid, and I'd make you know I'd earn some money working in the canneries, you know, up in Sacramento Delta, and uh, you know, in the canneries, I mean, it was all white people. We worked in the canneries, and uh, all the Filipinos uh, they worked out in in the fields picking uh, picking the produce. So he said, I was real curious about it, and and uh, when the strike began, I really, he said, I was you know I was just out of the service and." And uh, I really wanted to know what this all was all about. I mean, I came from the Appalachians, uh, you know, as a poor kid. And, and to see, uh, you know, this type of militancy, I really, really <laughs> got excited about it. He says, so I joined them. I, you know, we did a lot of support work. Um, he, he, I think he was, uh, he was still in college at that time. He said, we did a lot of support work for them. And, and actually, you know, Keeler's first wife was Filipino, and she was also in the CP, in the CPUSA. Um, so, and, and he remained uh, a close, um, uh, very close to Ed Leung uh, for, uh, you know, um, even uh, in Delano. He traveled down to Delano uh, to keep uh, Ed Leung um, informed and updated as to what the CPUSA would, you know, what, what the party was doing. And the, he became a member of the uh, ILW in Stockton. And, and then he moved down and became a member of the ILW Local 10 Longshore in San Francisco. Right. So let's remember, after the war, I mean, um, you know, a lot of the late Filipino labor leadership uh, deported, assassinated, um, uh, you know, harassed at, to no end by the FBI. Um, and so when you get into the McCarthy era, I mean, you know, Keeler, Idleong, all of them got blacklisted. There was no no place that they could get work, right? The only place, uh, the only where they could was through the ILW. Because the ILW, as you know, Harry Bridges was a communist. And, uh, yeah, of course, you know, they were welcomed. Uh, and uh, they joined up. Uh, they got work through the Union Hall. And... Um, uh, and so that's how they stayed in, in close contact. But uh, Ed Leong um, uh, really, I, I think, uh, became, uh, really learned uh, what it was to be a trade unionist uh, in as being a, a, an ILW uh, member. Um, and... Um, and that's important. That's very, very important to understand because everybody talks about Agbayani Village and how it was the dream of Chavez. And uh, I, I just can't believe that type of dis distorted <laughs> history uh, because uh, when I was uh, in Delano and, and, um, and uh, with Eat Leong, that was one of the biggest things that he talked about was the housing, the medical clinic that he that uh, was needed for agricultural workers, particularly for the the older Filipinos. And what what strikes were was Larry on? Well, I we know that he was in the forty eight agriculture. He was he was a young, so you would you would consider him like second line leadership. He was not in the forefront. Uh, Chris Mansalves, Ernest. Uh, M uh, Manawang, they were the strike leaders. And uh, Philip Veracruz was kind of peripheral. He was just beginning uh, to get involved. Uh, but Eat Leong was certainly there and really uh, wanting, um, uh, wanting to, uh, you know, move. And, and he had his opportunity because both uh, Mensalves um, and Manawang were uh, arrested. They were imprisoned. Uh, um, so the farm owners and the police and the state right. were, were arresting them as communists? What were they arrested yes, for? Yes, sedition. And they were charged. Uh, they were later uh, released, uh, but there was, um, and um, I'm very sure that the CPUSA worked on their defense, legal defense. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, that was a, a real example that uh, the big growers used, uh, you know, against... Um, 
um, against the strike leaders. And, and let's be clear, I mean, when we're talking about labor history and the organizing uh, of and the unionizing uh, of uh, workers in this country, it could not have been done without uh, the communists and the socialists and, and those that were... Um, uh, we're helping to inform and involve workers. Uh, otherwise, I mean, you'd only stay at, uh, uh, you know, at the level of trade unionizing. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't advance your understanding of capitalism uh, without being associated with, uh, 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 with a Marxist organization. It's just not possible. So what were so Larry be, was an organizer and he became involved in organizing Filipino workers. How, how did they organize? I think I think the way I look at him is more he was a trade unionist. Uh, he was a communist, but he understood the fundamental role that trade unions play in capitalism. Uh, workers under capitalism need an organiza uh, a workers organization that give they can they. That where they can um, articulate their voice and they can come together collectively to uh, push for those uh, reforms to better their wages, to better their working conditions. That's what he knew. Uh, and um, that's what he became known for. And he was also an internationalist. Of course, as a communist, he was an internationalist. The most important thing, and, and you know, everybody knows him through the 1965 grave strike, uh, what the UFW and many try to, the narrative they try to push is that, you know, um, the uh, movement among agricultural workers kind of started in 65. No, when you look at the life and times of the Filipino labor leadership, you're looking. You're looking decades back in the 20s and 30s and 40s into the 50s, and that shaped uh, a very, very tight, tightly knit uh, Filipino um, uh, working class and uh, and leadership. And Eat Leong was part of that leadership. So. Um, uh, you know, he was a man who built unions, who helped build unions, who brought uh, workers uh, together for those uh, for that purpose. But in '65, and this is this is the interesting thing, is that very few people, although they talk a lot about Delano, they don't talk about the Coachella strike. The Coachella strike was is significant because. It was it laid the groundwork for the Delano strike. If any, you know, um, th those of us who grew up and uh, you know at that time, um, let me just tell you uh, very quickly um, the conditions. Uh, I mean, I was just a kid when I started picking grapes. Uh, we'd come up from Imperial Valley, and we'd pick grapes in the Coachella Valley, and that's the Coachella Valley is the start of the season of the grapes picking grapes. And and we worked for uh, the Bianchi, uh, Bianchi. Now, they were growers. They were the big growers from the Delano area, Central Valley. They, they all owned uh, their vineyards down in Coachella Valley. And um, we were their biggest, uh, their biggest crews were Filipinos. And uh, So how old were you when you started picking grapes? About 13, 14 years old. Right, because we had a family farm, so it wasn't necessary really for us. But uh, what was happening during the late fifties and sixties is like all the rest of uh, small farmers. We were losing our farms, and it, uh, getting the family to go back and picking grapes. It was a desperate attempt to hold on to our farm, and so kids, even you know. All, everybody, we were we were expected to join our, uh, you know, in my case, our oldest uncles, uh, our older uncle, uh, to pick grapes in Coachella. And uh, so I remember, and uh, probably the second year uh, we went up there to to Mecca, um, and I said we we work for uh, work for uh, Bianchi uh, growers. Um, what were your conditions? I mean, here you're a young person, uh, teenager, you know, starting to work in the fields. 
Well, I'm, a, you know, I mean, I grew up on a farm. I'm used to working in the fields, uh, pack, uh, picking and packing in the warehouse, uh, you know, in the packing shed. But this was different. This is where you're not, you know, you're not under, you're under the control of an employer. And uh, in those days, and, and I'm talking early, early 60s when I started uh, um, um, at this time, and it seems like ancient history, but it's not that long ago. When you went to work, there was no minimum wage, okay? You, you, you know, whatever you got is because you fought for it from, from your boss, from the growers, right? Uh, secondly, there was no eight-hour day. You came to work when they told you, and you didn't go home until they told you to go home. And that's just the expression they used, go home. That's when you knew that you had, you know, you were going to stop working. Well, um, there was no restrooms. There's no shade. They don't provide you water. They don't provide you anything, you know. Um, so it was almost like slave, <laughs> slave-like conditions, uh, you know. They, they tell you what to do and what when to do it and how to work. Exactly. You're under their complete control. So in, um, so in our crew, uh, my uncle, of course, was a, a crew boss. So he knew, uh, he knew some of the um, older Filipinos that came down from Filipino, uh, from Delano. And, uh, you know, they would work together with us on our, on, um, on our line. And my sisters and, and the others, they would be picking the grapes. My uncle, I mean, I've always been a very good packer. So I was the packer for, uh, for us. And I remember that one day I was, you know, and um, it's not like now, you know, they give you all these conveyors and you can stand up and pack the vegetables and fruits. In those days, you did it on the ground. So I'm kneeling on the ground and I'm packing the grapes after my uncle prunes them. And he's facing me and I'm, fa you know, I'm looking out. And um, I notice uh, the boss and he's pacing back and forth in the field. I mean, in the road, you know, it's just a... Um, you know, a dusty road, and he's pacing back and forth, and he's looking down the road, and I'm thinking, like, uh, wh what's happening? What's, you know, what's going on? And um, and then all of a sudden, I see this truck, a flatbed truck, you know, uh, you know, with the wooden rails, and it comes right past me and stops. And at the same time, my uncle looks up, I look up, and... It, they have a whole crew of very young Mexican guys. And before <laughs> we could even gather our thoughts, they're jumping off of the truck, grabbing our crates. I shouldn't say our crates, it belonged to the growers. But they started picking the grapes. And uh, he, you know, Bianchi turns to us, looks at us, and tells us. This is go. the owner. Yeah, the owner. Go home. I, I'm pretty sure his parents owned it. He was one of the younger, you know. From the Bianchi family. Yeah. And was telling all the Filipinos, go home. That's it. And uh, I kind of want to ask my Uncle Bob, are we going to get paid for any of this? No. Uh-uh. So um, that, was, that was that kind of treatment. I mean, they, the growers did a lot of dirty things. That's pretty overt. Uh, very overt. I mean, uh, they'd have us go to the packing sheds in Indio, uh, and they tell us we had to repack every box that we packed without any pay. We they, we didn't get paid a penny, not even to drive all the way from Mecca to Indio to repack all the boxes uh, there, you know, waiting to put, be put on the train to the L.A. produce market. And so, uh, you know... Uh, that's pretty brutal. It's it's very brutal. So you know you you uh, you grow up with that, and I and I you know the the one thing I remember uh, thinking to myself is, what kind of country do I live in? <laughs> they treat kids like this. If they treated me like this, I knew in an instant that my uncle and other Filipinos had been experiencing this for decades. This is this is not just. You know, this isn't just, uh, it just happened. This has been happening, and that's when I, that's when I can say I really understood Filipino workers' history from that very moment. I could see how uh, growers, how agribusiness used, um, used the divide and conquer. 
now the and and it was so unfortunate even you know that uh, you know some of the younger Filipinos started blaming the Mexicans. I said, why would you blame the Mexicans? Right? They're as poor as us. They're as hungry for work as us. Right? It's the growers. They're the ones. You know who control who works and doesn't work on their on their uh, you know in, in their vineyards. So why are we blaming Mexicans? That's that's just stupid. You know, come on. You know, probably you know they could do the same thing. They could bring us in and fire all the Mexicans, right? So you know, you just have to understand that divide and conquer game that the work that the uh, growers use all the time. And in agriculture, one thing. Uh, if anybody has ever worked in agriculture, you know that it's a very, very segregated workforce. A very segregated workforce. They have always that's a, that's been one of the successes of agribusiness is that they've been able to keep uh, uh, you know the the nationalities and the races apart. Nowadays, um, it's it's a different game because I would say maybe about ninety percent of all the agriculture workforce now is uh, Mexican, is Latino. So um, that's not something that they could uh, do very well. Although I think that they still try to work the you know the tensions uh, of the Mexican Americans and the Mexicanos, you know that. But uh, so so the growers used pitted you know the. Mexican workers, Mexican uh, farm workers, agriculture workers against the Filipinos. What other experiences do you have like that? Well, uh, <laughs> I want to I want to move on to how it's done in very subtle forms, because I think if we tr trying to understand the uh, uh, the uh, state of agricultural workers today, we truly have to understand. What happened after 65? Okay, like I said, the, experiences, the experience that I just related was some of what led up to the 1965 Coachella strike. Uh, it Leong, uh, the others, uh, as part of the labor um, uh, leadership, Ben Gimes, uh, Pete Velasco, they came and they helped to organize a very, very successful strike in Coachella, and we won that strike. We won that strike. They did increase our wages, and we weren't uh, blacklisted or thrown out like we like we were before. So, so they won. Did they win a union contract? That's the hard part. Is union recognition to this day has eluded agricultural workers. It really has, and uh, so, um, so like I said, uh, that's May June. And the end of the harvest uh, is in Delano. Delano is where the harvest ends. And that, you know, Delano in that day was a big Filipino town. That's where all the Filipinos, uh, we came together uh, to finish the harvest of grapes. Okay. And so when the, when the second strike, and that was the Delano strike, was called for, uh, we were all, you know, the Filipino workers, we were all ready. We'd already done the Coachella strike. Um, and that's that that's important to understand because It Leong and the rest of the Filipino labor leadership, they had been in this for decades. They had been unionizing for decades. This isn't something that they just, you know, um, you know, came uh, decided, you know, to do in '65. Unlike, and I'm going to tell you again, unlike Chavez and Huerta. Chavez and Huerta, before 65, were never involved in strike actions, were never involved in unionizing. They used the term organizing, right? They were with the Community Service Organization, CSO, and then they formed the National Farm Workers Association. And what was the CSO? Um, it was a Catholic-funded uh, community organizing project. Uh, like a help volunteer help organization. Yeah. Or, you know, right, social so, social services. Social services help the workers understand, uh, you know, uh, you know how you, how to navigate your way in this society, <laughs> that type of thing. But it really is not about uh, putting the power in the hands of workers, uh, because. Uh, th that's what a strike does. A strike uh, uh, allows the workers to understand their muscle. 
you know, what strength do we have and how can we use it to negotiate better terms uh, in the workplace? You know, community organizing doesn't do that at all, okay? It's just um, it's just basic reformism, right? But so, so that's where they come out of. You're exactly. saying that they came out of a different tradition Very good than the Filipino tradition. organizing, Larry Leong and other organizers who are already leading strikes. Right. Organizing workers and taking on the bosses. You're right, Steve. So you're looking at two very, very different traditions that came together in 1965. And that uh, and that first tradition, like I told you, was the trade union movement, which was heavily influenced by the Communist Party, by, uh, by those who had gone through the 20s and 30s and 40s as, uh, you know, participating in strikes and militant actions. Uh, compared to what came, um, you know, uh, particularly after World War II, and that's the Saul Alinsky, the community organizing model. And who was Saul Alinsky? He was, he was based in Chicago and he, uh, you know, um, and uh, as a pushback to trade union uh, unionize, unionizing, formulated this whole thing about, well, instead of, you know, organizing on the, at the workplace, let's do it in the community where, you know, um, and that, uh, what that did was that it took, um, it took, uh, it, uh, it, it, it took away the instrument of the strike. So you were no longer confronting the capitalists, right? I mean, um, you know, the whole point of the strike is that the bosses are not going to make any profits, right? And that's what keeps them going, right? So if you move it out, right, out of that arena, and take it into the community. How are you? How are you hurting capitalism, right? How are you striking back at capitalism from the community? You're not. It's at the workplace because this is where the capitalists, you know, that's their that's their livelihood. That's their lifeblood, right? That's how they make money off of our backs, right? And uh, that's how you get the billionaires that we have today is at the workplace, not in the community. So what you have are, are folks like, um, uh, uh, like Chavez and Huerta and Padilla, and they came out of the CSO. So they, their, their tradition was uh, we're there to help the poor, uh, pitiful farm workers uh, to, um, you know, to better their life and better conditions. In other words, they were going to do it for for us, right? We didn't have to do it anymore. Uh, you know, they were going to do it for us. They were going to lead us to to that. <laughs> and, and they looked to, uh, Saul Linsky looked to uh, uh, the uh, Kennedys and the, the Democratic Party. Do they see them as critical to organizing farm workers? Yeah, I mean, that's the whole school of Alinsky uh, was that. So, um, um, and, and this is, um, um, you know, I know in a recent program, that program at um, October 24th in Poplar, California, uh, where uh, a lot of the Democratic um, officials and where well, to appear. Well, before we get to that, I mean, the, the history of Larry Itliong and the Filipino farm workers uh, has not been covered in the media until recently, that it's been a holiday, then there are meetings. Why wasn't uh, the role of Larry Leong, what happened in the Delano strike and the connection, the linkage between the Chavez and Dolores Huerta and others with the Larry Leong took place? Well, let me put it this way. The Chavez faction and the UFW robbed us of our history. They stole our history. And it wasn't an omission, okay? It wasn't that they overlooked or they forgot <laughs> that I Leong and Veracruz and, and the Filipino workers that we, that we, you know, that we launched the strike. No. It was a very calculated move on their part to wrap the movement around themselves to give themselves all the credit of the strikes and uh, the movement that, uh, that followed it. That was, I mean, if you look at the Chavez Foundation and the Huerta Foundation, the UFW, I mean, they're worth millions. 
They built their political careers and their fortunes on that narrative, right? So, so, um, so Delano, what you're saying is Delano was a Filipino working class community. It was. And yet, and, and uh, they joined the Filipino workers, Larry Idleon, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee. Why don't you talk about that and how that connected with the United Farm Workers of America? Well, again, you know, like I said, uh, you know, as a kid picking grapes in Coachella, I saw it right there. They were going to, uh, you know, if we went on strike, they were going to bring in Mexican scab workers, right? They are going to replace us. Um, and it was going to happen in Delano. All of Filipino labor leadership understood that tactic. I mean, they'd seen it time and time and time again, right? So by the time you get to Delano, the first thing you need to do is you need to build the workers' alliance. You need to, you know, bring the working class together and... Um, and uh, that's exactly what the Filipino uh, leadership uh, did. Uh, Eat Leon, Gimes, and the others, they went to uh, the, in, uh, the na National, Mex um, National, Workers, uh, National Farm Workers Alliance, which was, which was a Mexican organization, um, uh, uh, Chavez and Padilla and Huerta. And, um, you know, they talked about, listen, uh, you know, we've called a strike. We want to make sure that you're not going to be scabby, that workers aren't going to cross the picket lines. We want you to join on the strike. And now, it already led the Coachella strike. Yes, yes, and so we, there, are, there, we there's... already succeeded. And so we, we felt uh, very confident that if we could unite uh, the Mexican workers uh, with us, that uh, it was a strike that we could not lose. Um, uh, um, I know that they'll give a different account, but uh, Chavez uh, always, always, since he had never participated in a strike, always hesitated. And he did not want, he did not want to go on strike when Leon and the others first approached him. He did not want to. Uh, it took several attempts. And finally, I think he just got outvoted by the by his uh, by his own members, by the Mexican workers, who saw, you know, hey, the, the Filipinos are on strike. Oh, what? What are we? Gonna, we're going to cross the picket line? No. So um, that was the merger. That was the merger that happened in the Delano strike. And. Uh, uh, the Coachella strike w w was a, a much uh, easier one because everyone, you know, everyone came together. Uh, uh, Delano was a bigger town. It, it, uh, this was the home of the growers. This is this was their territory. They owned this town, even though you know it was our Filipino town. Uh, we were kind of like their workforce, and it was a company town. And it was segregated, as you were saying. Very segregated. Everybody who knows Delano is like any other uh, any other farm town. Uh, you know, on the west side were white folks, and the other side was Chinatown. That was, uh, you know, that was where everybody, all the workers uh, lived, where all the packing houses were along the, the railroad line. But... Uh, uh, so what happened, like I said, you, you have two different traditions coming in to the 65 grape strike. And unfortunately, uh, the tradition that went out uh, was uh, this, this quasi-religious uh, nationalist movement that uh, Chavez and Huerta promoted. So... Um, this is a Saul Linsky type. Right. Problem. And so you saw it by who surrounded and who, uh, who Chavez and Huerta relied on as their advisors were whites that came out of that. So there was Fred Ross, there was Marshall Gans. I mean, these people uh, were very clear that they were going to take it away from a trade union movement into this type of, mm, like I said, a quasi-religious, quasi, you know, this very nationalist. And so <clears throat> by the time that 
I went back to Delano, you know, and I went back to Delano because I had already, you know, I was, um, it, I mean, we're talking about five years later. Um, I'm, I'm a college student and my brothers are still working, you know, they're, they're part of the long distance lettuce crews. And, and I'm hearing from them that, uh, Filipinos aren't signing up where they're not joining UFW. And I'm thinking like, what, this is our union. What, what are you talking about? No, no, no. It's a Mexican union now. What do you mean it's a Mexican union? You see, you see it. It's, you know, it's not for us anymore. I said, well, what's Itleon doing? What's Velasco doing? So that's when I went up to Delano and I said, I want to see for myself what is happening. What has happened from the time that we went on strike in 65 to now, now it's 1970, right? And so um, in those days, the Filipino Hall, that was the anchor of every Filipino community. And um, it's one of the biggest contribution of the first generation of Filipinos is that you'll find Filipino halls every, in every town that Filipinos had a presence. And so... That was like their community center, their coming together. Well, community. it was more a union hall. It was more a workers, okay? It wasn't about community. You know, it wasn't about this, now they have it all, you know, cultural hall. It was not about culture. It was a workers' it was hall. Workers, <laughs> right? <laughs> And, uh, you know, and that, I mean, we came to this country as workers, uh, and we're going to continue identifying as that because that's what we are, right? So, I mean, that's where, where I went. And at that time, uh, the Filipino Hall was still uh, the strike headquarters, was, was uh, where the UFW came out of, okay? That's where the merger happened. And, uh, um so before it moved out of Delano and um, and kind of detached itself from the workers, <clears throat> but uh, so um, you know it, it, uh, it's interesting. Like I said, I I was raised in the very old way. Uh, uh, my my uh, my father, my uncles. I mean, um, if you know how. Um, uh, Filipino kids were raised, <laughs> you know, uh, we, uh, we questioned, but we, um, um, but we understood a lot more by just observing, right? So, uh, when I got there to the hall, you know, um, the first place you always go to the hall is you go to the kitchen because that's where, you know, you get to know, you know, who's who and who's who. And, um, they didn't see very many Filipino kids like me. So when I walk into the hall, you know, they're all, um, uh, and I tell them I'm from Imperial Valley, I'm from Nyland. They immediately knew who I was and what I was. I didn't have to explain anything else about my background. And so immediately, of course, Ed Leung took took me under his wing. And so I kind of became his, uh, you know, little sidekick. I'd fall, you know, you know, he'd take me everywhere and like that. So one day we were in the hall, and I just, um, I just remember, like most of the Filipinos, they're standing in the back or at the side, you know, uh, watching, you know, um, in the meeting. And um, I remember the Chavez is standing in the center. It's a table, and uh, Philip Veracruz is on one side, and Itliong is on the other side. And uh, Chavez is just droning on and on. He completely monopolizes the meeting. There is no other, there's no workers talking. It's just Chavez talking. And I'm thinking like, wait a minute. Uh, I thought this was supposed to be a workers meeting or something, right? You thought it was a union meeting with yeah. the Democratic union meeting. with, with the But no, it was not that at all. But the most interesting thing was that it was all in Spanish. And so the um, meeting wasn't quite over, and Ileon got up, and uh, as, uh, you know, uh, he, as he walked uh, towards the back, I joined him. And uh, I was pretty blunt, you know. I said, why is Chavez only speaking in Spanish? This is the Filipino hall. What? Uh, I mean, does he, you know, uh, uh, like, we don't, we're not here? He doesn't see us? I mean, I was really angry. And, um, you know, Yi Leung, uh, like I said, in the old way, you know, he looks at me. It's to say, I acknowledge what you've said. I, I understand your question. 
I don't have an answer for you right now. He doesn't say it. He just, it's just that look. That's how, you know, you, 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 you know, you're. He, under, he understood. Yeah, he understood. Uh, and he understood my anger. And he understood how upset I was. Uh, but he doesn't have an answer for me. And it's like, you know, growing up, when you ask, uh, if you ask somebody older, an older Filipino, you know, and you don't, and um, they don't have the answer. It's not like today. People just talk off the top of the head, and they just say whatever, right? Uh, no, that's not the way. You have to have a very good, uh, you have to think what your answer should be. Uh, you have to find the facts about it. You have to understand because what you're going to say is going to carry on to that next generation. And that's the way. It was a very responsible way, right? A very mature way. So as we walked back um, uh, to the kitchen, the kitchen was in the back of the hall. Uh, all the Filipinos were in the kitchen. And um, I could feel that they were as disappointed as me. Um, it like uh, wasn't their union. It wasn't. And I realized that right then and there that we had lost. It was, it was a very painful, it's still painful. Uh, and it Leong, as you know, the year uh, one year later, uh, resigned. And that's what I say to a lot of folks uh, that want to recount this history. They want to recount a very romanticized history that's not true. Yes, there was a merger, and it was a very happy and exciting time that the Filipino and the Mexican workers got together on the, on the Delano strike. But listen, the marriage did not last. It ended in a divorce, and the divorce meant that Filipinos, we got kicked out of our own, <laughs> of our own hall. Right. That's that's how bad it was. It was not a nice divorce. It was a very mean divorce. If you want if you want to see how vicious it was, read the accounts on how Philip Veracruz was thrown out of the UFW. Read why. How, how was he thrown out? Well, you know, uh, the months before that, uh, <clears throat> Chavez had uh, gone to the Philippines at the invitation of, uh, of a dictator, of Marcos, right? And uh, let's make it very clear when I say what a dictator was. Every trade union, every la labor unionist in the Philippines had already been arrested, assassinated, right, or jailed. That's where they were when, when uh, Chavez got to Manila. And uh, those who claimed to be labor leaders, right, were his own henchmen. Or the AFL-CIO supported unionists. Right. Those who... Those <laughs> who supported capitalism and the corporations. Exactly. And, you know, and all the foreign capital, you know, corporations that now do business in the Philippines. And the AFL-CIO is still there supporting these same corporate trade unions. It is. It's, it certainly is. Yeah. And it, uh, it, it works, you know, on behalf of U.S. capitalism. You know, make sure that the workers, uh, you know, stay in tow. So Cesar Chavez actually, by going to the Philippines mm -hmm. and supporting the Marcos government, giving credibility right. to the Marcos government, was actually slapping the face of the Filipinos workers. in workers in, in California who right. did not support Marcos and the, the kind of attacks he was making on workers there. Of course not. I mean, uh, at the, at, at the uh, convention, and, and I wasn't there, but from all accounts, um, there were several people, including uh, Rudy Reyes, who, try, who put the, uh, who had put the, uh, um, what, uh, the resolution forward uh, to condemn uh, the Marcos regime, and um, and and uh, you know there was widespread support for that, but the Chavez faction uh, quickly squashed that. Um, um, and I mean, as far as the trade union structure, they really didn't want a debate. Their idea of a union was quite different than. Uh, 
Philip Veracruz, uh, you know, Philip Veracruz, and also Larry Itliong. What was their difference in how a union should be? Well, uh, let's be very clear. Chavez never set out to create a union. Never. Uh, that experience in the union hall where um, Chavez was just going on um, and nobody else spoke. And, only, and, uh, and he wasn't speaking to us, <laughs> okay? If you're only speaking in Spanish and you're not allowing anyone else to speak, uh, you know, uh, that, that we knew was not a worker's. So what Chavez <clears throat> really built was a very top-down organization, very top-down. Nobody challenged his authority. Nobody criticized him. Nobody questioned him. You know, it was almost like, like a cult, it was like the Moonies, right? You don't question the leader. It was just, it was just bizarre, right? Uh, and and I uh, and I challenge anybody who was there at that time to tell me that that's not how Chavez uh, ran the UFW, including Huerta. She knew, she knows that. Okay. Um, the other thing is that union, of course, a trade union, uh, it believes in worker democracy. So it's going to go, it's going to establish itself everywhere. There's workers, right? Uh, the UFW never had any locals. Can you, can you imagine a trade union without locals? You don't build locals anywhere else. You're organizing in the Salinas Valley. You're organizing in Imperial County. But you don't establish a local in those areas? Of course. Why not? Because he did not want any, uh, any challenge to his leadership. And the Chavez faction was real clear about that. Okay, there was not going to be any other workers. They were going to be in the leadership position as he was. And so as a result, even though there were, you know, time and time again, there were some great, great worker uh, leaders, natural born leaders. And no, he made clear that they never shared the podium with him. And uh, secondly, if you knew about, I, uh, since uh, Chavez and Huerta and them, they had no experience establishing a union hall. It was shambles from the very beginning. It was the, it was the worst experience, and it drove out uh, the majority of Filipinos. Why? Because we we were really migrant workers. We traveled up and down from the Alaskan canneries to Washington, and, and uh, you know throughout the Southwest and West Coast. So we weren't at the union hall day after day after day waiting, you know, to to get picked up for a job. And because we weren't, we got pushed to the bottom. You know, we got pushed to the bottom. The Mexican workers who were there, who didn't, you know, and, and it's basically because they had families and they didn't migrate, um, they got top priority on the jobs now. Uh, what kind of union hall was that? And I asked Huerta today, what type of union hall <laughs> did the Chavez faction create? Right? It, it was just the worst experience. And I think out of that experience, most of the Filipinos said, no, this is not what we set out to do. When we went on strike in 65, we wanted co a collective bargaining unit. We wanted a true union. In the end, the U and that's the true legacy of the UFW, is that it did not unionize the uh, the agricultural workforce. It did not create the union of workers, of agricultural workers, that the Filipino labor leadership had uh, strived to create for decades. It just simply did not. So that's why I said the legacy today of the UFW is that 98 percent of all agricultural workers are not unionized and don't have an organization. And Al Rojas and Elena Rojas mm -hmm. were close to Larry Itliong, um, and they as well uh, were unhappy with some of the things that were going on. Very unhappy because they also, I mean, they were workers, and this is this is another hallmark of trade unionism, is that it is a rank and file organization. In other words, the workers run the union, right? The workers. In other words, every Filipino that was in the labor leadership was there because they were rank and file. They had worked in the fields. They had worked in the canneries. They had worked, okay, doing the work that the workers did. Chavez and Huerta, 
they had never worked. Okay, they're not rank and file. And yet they made themselves the leaders of an agricultural organization. And that, I said, that was a fundamental difference. If you're building a workers' organization, then the workers need to run it. And Chavez was not ever, a, you know, a rank and file worker. In Poplar, California, mm -hmm. there was a commemoration there to commemorate Larry Itlong, Itlong the center there was set up mm -hmm. um, many years after Larry Itlong died and after his his and the role of the Filipino workers had been pretty much ex, uh, removed from the real history. All right. What was that all about? Well, that's still part of that false narrative that the UFW uh, created. It's a revisionist history. And uh, they perpetuate it. And this event <laughs> that they had is one of those. Okay, It's um, an event where they named a, a building after It Leong. And, um, <clears throat> however, they really do not discuss the history <laughs> of Poplar and uh, the violence of uh, uh, that occurred there, you know. So, um, uh, uh, Ed Leong and Al Rojas grew to be uh, good friends, and they base, you know, both of them resigned and left uh, because they knew it was no longer a workers' organization. The Chavez faction was not interested at all in listening to the workers and uh, following what the workers uh, really desired you know, to do. Um, Chavez pushed not the strike, okay? As if you know uh, trade unionism, the strike is the best instrument you have to fight back uh, the bosses. They pushed the boycott, and the boycott was, uh, it's out of the hands of the workers. Let the consumers, right, uh, carry out the movement, carry out, and, uh, uh, you know, that pretty much disarms workers, Right. It could be a support activity, but under the Chavez faction, the boycott became the main juror activity. It was no longer the strikes. It was no longer working or the ranch committees. It was no longer rank and file organizing. It was organizing in the cities, basically uh, among white supporters. And uh, that's where, you know, like I said, the power, it just uh, slips out of your hands. And, uh, and that's what I saw when I last saw Idlion, you know, that, we, that the power that we had, uh, uh, that we had uh, gathered over the years and that we could strike, you know, in 65, um, it just, it slipped. It uh, fell out of our hands. And what got picked up, by the Chavez faction was remolded into a history that excluded us. And that's why I said, you know, for, as Filipinos, our history, the UFW under the Chavez faction, they stole our history. They robbed it of us. And now they're making these little claims. Okay, we remember Eat Leong. Like, oh, you remember? Right. You and, remember. and Dolores Huerta said that she had organized Larry Itliong uh, in her statement at that Poplar uh, meeting. I mean, what did you feel when you when you heard that? You know, it's a long line of outrageous <laughs> and uh, a, a distorted, a very convoluted history that um, that, sh that 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 she is. Uh, speaking of. I mean, how can you, you know, I think I was more disturbed by the fact that no one corrected her. No one stood up and said, excuse me, uh, can you give us some facts to, the, to, to your statement that you organized Larry Idlion? I mean, how old were you in 1965? Excuse me, how old were you when you met Idlion? Ed Leong had been organizing since the 20s and 30s and 40s. He helped lead major strikes. Uh, tell me, what strike, Huerta, were you involved in before you met Ed Leong? 
See, and that's the false narrative that the UFW pushes, is that nothing happened before 65. Well, yes, the <laughs> agricultural workers have been organizing, right, uh, uh, for decades. It didn't just start in 65. But that's where the UFW tries to keep that narrative. It all started in 65. They don't want to they don't want us to see what came before then. And that's when, you know, if you see that, then you begin to understand Eat Leong in historical context. Right? Uh once you begin to understand that, you understand that Huerta in no way organized Larry Eat Leong. <laughs> in no way. She was mentored. He was her mentor. Yeah. And she also, in her presentation, uh, did not mention really Elena Rojas, who had been attacked, injured at the uh, their home, which was next to the Union District office. At that time, it's rather strange that she wouldn't mention the person that was actually physically attacked as Al Rojas's wife. That's not surprising. Like I said, these are people who built their careers focused on themselves. They're really not going to give credit. They're not really going to speak to others that were part of that history. They're just not. Uh, they want the spotlight. They want the limelight on themselves. I mean, after all, that's how Huerta became the darling of the Democratic Party, right? By, <laughs> by keeping the limelight on herself, right? And, uh, and so she's going to continue that. Uh, that is, um, uh, that's her role, right? Uh, uh, she's not, she never was a rank-and-file organ, uh, union uh, organizer. Uh, she was always aligned with the Democratic Party um, and the forces to be. But a, a lot of young people mm -hmm. now who are going to school, that professor who spoke at the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Rodriguez, mm -hmm. who spoke there, um, did not mention that, that Larry Lung was a communist. He was a political activist. And they're, and they're not. Uh, they're not because that's that's a, a history that they're still frightened <laughs> about, you know. So they're afraid to mention that Larry Itliong actually was a communist. A communist yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and 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 almost all the Filipino labor leadership, right? They were they were members of the Communist Party. They were Marxist, I and mean, you can read the writings of Philip Veracruz, and you can't tell nobody reading his reading what he wrote cannot can you know uh, cannot say that he's a marxist he had a very they all spoke in class uh, in class struggle terms they understood capitalism they understood um, and and that's you know here's an, a very interesting thing about chavez that people don't realize is that he did not know how to negotiate contractors contracts he didn't understand collective bargaining. He completely relied on his attorneys. That's not true with Eat Leong. Eat Leong, um, and, and, and that's where he was brilliant. Uh, he could sit uh, at the same table as a grower, face to face, and negotiate a contract. He didn't need lawyers and advisors. He knew <laughs> what the workers wanted, and you, he knew how to press for that. And... Uh, isn't that a requirement of a union leader? You would think so. I mean, he was a business agent. I mean, you know, he, he you know, you get trained, right? You, uh, you know, these aren't things that you go through the CSO and learn, right? You don't go through community organizing and learn how to be, how to be a trade unionist. No, that's a whole different tradition, and uh, that is the history that is really being. Um, being uh, hidden and and um, uh, and falsified in many ways. Um, uh, so with, um, like I said, with uh, Eat Leong, I mean, nobody is born with this knowledge and this expertise. You get trained. And, and very clearly, it was through the CIO. It was through being in the Communist Party. It was through engaging in numerous strike actions that he became uh, the trade unionist that he was. But from the very beginning, I mean, the UFW always had a very anti-communist line. 
they didn't, uh, you know, you listen to uh, their spokesman today, Mark uh, Grossman. Now you tell me how somebody who never worked in the fields can now be the spokesperson for UFW. It just shows you the true nature of, <laughs> of that organization. And, I mean, the, the history of anti-communism, I mean, Cesar Chavez became a cult leader. He, did. he joined uh, a cult organization, Sinanon. Um, that's never really talked about by the UFW. Uh, never. Uh, they don't. They don't ever talk about that in his later years. He became mentally ill. I mean, he lost complete touch with reality, and I. I never realized that until I was at a table, uh, just having you know having uh, coffee with Gilbert Padilla and uh, Al Rojas. Um, uh, in Fresno, uh, I, I guess that was in 2014, and it was, you know, um, it was as if they were, you know, recounting those days, and they began to talk about, you know, Cesar Chavez, you know, their last memories of him, and I, to tell you the truth, I, I was really taken aback. They both, uh, they both knew that he was mentally ill. And what I couldn't understand is that why didn't the families, why didn't the Chavez family try to get him, you know, professional help? Uh, but from all accounts, from what Rojas had, had said, you know, that the last time he had gone up there to La Paz to see uh, Chavez, he was walking around with those two big white dogs that he always had uh, with him. And uh, uh, Al says, you know, he, he called out to him, Cesar. You know, and he says he, he didn't he didn't quite register. You know, he just kind of looked around. He didn't respond. And uh, Roja says, I called out and I and I said, it's Al. It's Al. I'm, you know, and uh, and he said, Chavez started beating on his chest saying, I'm Cesar Chavez. I'm Cesar Chavez. And, uh, uh, you know, I and Roja said, I, then, I, I knew then that he, he was lost. You, you know, he was just lost in himself, right? And this, this kind of cult figure that is built up, uh, the, a lot of people who think that they're experts mm -hmm. about the farm workers seem to propagate that idealization of Cesar Chavez. What does that say about them as historians and um, really uh, objectively telling the truth about the United Farm Workers? Well, there's always been revisionist history, right? Those who write, rewrite history, especially those who try to romanticize it, and those who don't want to look at history and understand the bitter lessons that come out of it. And that was a very bitter moment for us when we realized that we had lost, in the end, we had lost um, uh, to the Chavez faction uh, our drive to build uh, uh, a union f uh, among agricultural workers. It, uh, yeah. And so today, you know, when Robin Rodriguez and all the others talk about, you know, we're, you know, we're going to continue in doing that and we're going to bring together Filipino and Mexican workers, I said, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, first of all, you have not done a class analysis at all. There are so few Filipino work, uh, Filipinos working in the fields now. Uh, all the Filip uh, you know, and my family, they're still working, but we're working all in mixed crews. There's not enough Filipinos anymore working in the fields to make up Filipino crews per se. It's basically all Mexicano. Uh, I, that's that's the tremendous uh, change that's that's happened since the '60s. Okay, uh, so that type of uh, racial unity that you're looking at it doesn't exist. What you're going to have to look at is among uh, the Latinos that there are more and more people from Central America and um, and uh, various parts. And and like I said, uh, back in the '60s, rarely, rarely did you see anyone uh, any, uh, Mexicans coming from the Michoacan, from the Oaxaca. I mean, that just shows you the intrusion of U.S. capital, that it's going further and further south. And the privatization of uh, Mexico mm -hmm. through NAFTA, mm -hmm. 
the selling off of the ajitos uh -huh. uh, to U.S. corporations, the establishment by Driscoll of uh, basically slave labor plantations in Baja. Mm -hmm. um, what was Chavez's position towards these immigrant workers from Latin, from Mexico? Well, that's another part of the revision history that the romanticists uh, want don't want to look at, <laughs> and that is that because the Chavez faction were not trade unionists, they did not have a mature um, a approach, a, a political approach. How about a humanist approach? A humanist approach to those who... Uh, you know who who crossed picket lines, who were scabs, and uh, so what did the what did the Chavez faction did? They they began to collaborate with the U.S. government to deport uh, Mexican workers. Uh, this was part of the very shameful and like I uh, one good thing I'll say about Gilbert Padilla is that he never uh, he never went along with it, but Huerta sure did. Okay. All the Chavez faction, they basically, nobody, uh, you know, it's just like today. I mean, uh, why aren't people questioning uh, these really dirty tactics that the Chavez faction used? I mean, uh, you are not going to unite the working class by turning in, uh, by calling up the INS and giving them names and where they live and where they work to get them picked up by the migra. Uh, how are you building working class solidarity by doing that? I mean, so that's very clear that you're not building any trade union of any type. And now that their labor broker offices right. in Mexico, why don't you talk about that whole idea that a union mm -hmm. would go to Mexico under the auspices of the Mexican government and set up an office to bring workers to the United States? Well, I sure wish that Al Rojas was here because he sure, you know, he studied that, he knew more about it, he, you know, he experienced that, and he was the one who told me that the UFW, I mean, they are labor brokers now, uh, and they do it under under the pretext of, well, we, making sure that the Mexican workers get treated fairly and right when they, you know, uh, their terms, uh, when they come to the U.S., but he had told me that they have offices now, and uh, they're like recruiting halls, you know, uh, for uh, for agribusiness in the U.S. here. And, uh, but they're union members. Uh, well, no, you have to, come on. I, I, I'd like to debate anybody who wants to tell me the UFW is a union or ever became a union. I want to, you know, like I said, I mean, it's an agency shop. I mean, under yeah. under right. NAFTA and USMCA, they bring these workers in, right? And they're bound to that particular, you know, farmer or corporation, corporate exactly. farmer, and they can't go anyplace else. And they're kind of like indentured servants. Well, it's the new Bracero program. That's what it is. It's a new Bracero program, and. Um, uh, nowadays, they have they have the UFW to do some of that that work for them in 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 Mexico, and uh, it's shameful. And flock as well, farm labor organizing committee. I don't know too much about yeah. you know. They have offices, offices in in uh, Mexico as well, but yeah. the idea of the uh, recruiting for these corporations, agricultural corporations, workers. Right. And bringing them under a situation which they're not free labor, mm -hmm. they're indentured to that that company, right. that yeah. corporation. Right. What does that have to do with unionism? It doesn't, but that's what happens to organizations, right, who are not grounded in the trade unionist tradition, that they lose their <laughs> they lose their way and they get uh, co opted by agribusiness and. Uh, um, and they justify it to themselves that they're actually helping workers. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I tell folks, you know, workers know what they want. You know, workers know what they want. And what I always tell people is, you know what, why don't you just get out of our way and we'll get it ourselves. Yeah, just what James Brown says. Just get out of our way. We'll get it ourselves. So if the UFW would just get out of the way and stop talking about that it's trying to get a social justice, right? <laughs> uh, I think that workers in this country, especially in the agricultural sector, uh, they are beginning. I, I, I see it now. I mean, there have been walkouts against uh, wonderful citrus. 
and the workers showing up and being told that they're going to uh, cut, uh, you know, they're going to reduce their peace, uh, peace rate. Uh, and the workers are walking out. They've done that near where, um, in Tulare County. They did it in Kern County. Uh, and the UFW is nowhere to be found. So they're not organizing. I mean, the mass of agriculture workers in California are unorganized. There's no organizing drive by the UFWA in Central Valley. Uh, no, they, they are not. Uh, they're not unionizing. They're not. They don't have. That's not their purpose. Okay, at all. So you're not going to find them. Uh, they, they they don't have uh, uh, folks in the fields, um, you know, or being in contact with rank and file, trying to create a union, not at all. Now, after the Poplar events, there was a rally there, and uh, Desiree Rojas spoke, and Johnny Leong spoke. You went to another location. Why don't you talk about that experience? Well, that was very interesting, because when we first start seeing it, you know, coming up on social media about the Poplar event, you know, what was kind of highlighted was the center part of it, is that there was going to be the big presentation <clears throat> at um, in Poplar at the uh, Itliong Resource Center, and that was, um, and, you know, uh, what I had seen in the program was uh, Elena and Desiree Rojas were going to be the first speakers. When in fact, they didn't speak at the main program at all, <laughs> which uh, to me. Again, I you know people said, well, you know, it's interesting UFW isn't here. I said they are here. They permeate this event. You just have to understand how they operate. And so as the day unfolded, I think people began to understand. So the, the program was to open up in that way. Then, uh, so instead, uh, Desiree, they do the march. Uh, we had understood that we were going to go to their home, uh, to where they lived, uh, and it's it's the the office as well, and that's where the attack uh, by these right wing growers um, when they fired in uh, and injured Elena Rojas. Uh, but that didn't happen at all. What happened is that they walked from uh, the resource center to the end of town to this dirt lot, and that's where they expected uh, Rojas to speak. I, if I was Desiree, I would have spoken up right then and there. Uh-uh. That's not... Because I asked her then, I says, you know, the program's ending, Desiree. When are you going to speak? Oh, you know, it was like, whoa, I could see the change in the air now. Right? So the next part was that we were supposed to go to Delano. We were supposed to go to the Filipino Hall, and we were supposed to do a historical tour. So many of the Filipinos, right, we went from Poplar to Delano. We were waiting outside the Filipino Hall, and nothing materializes. Nothing. And I said, okay, all right. Now I begin to, you know, <laughs> UFW is at work again. <laughs> okay. So they completely took out the middle part of that program, which was supposed to be the Filipino Hall. That's in the program. Yeah, right. It's in the program, right? It's in the program. And they completely take it out. The, and then there's no explanation. No explanation as to why that was done. They take us directly from Poplar to 40 Acres. What is 40 Acres? Well, that's where the UFW, when, when Chab is um, kind of, um, you know, I mean, you can't exactly uh, throw out all the Filipinos and continue operating out of the Filipino Hall. <laughs> in Delano, right? <laughs> so um, Chab is at that point moved uh, the UFW headquarters uh, outside about two miles uh, west of Delano to what they called 40 Acres. And uh, that's where um, the official office was, the headquarters was. And so from Poplar, you know, like I said, we were supposed to go to the Filipino Hall and do the historical tour. That completely got dropped, and instead, the caravan uh, with Huerta and all her followers mm -hmm. uh, went directly to 40 acres. 
And, and what happened there? You had come up with a group of farmers or agricultural right. workers. It's the Farmers Cooperative. What is the Farmers Cooperative? Well, we're, we're a cooperative of Filipino farmers, and we grow exclusively Filipino vegetables, exclusively for Filipino people, and we sell exclusively within the Filipino community. Right. Uh, so, so you had set up a table in Poplar. Right, we did. And we basically sold out all our vegetables there. So we had some left, and we were selling some there in um, at the 40 acres. Uh, but like I said, after we left Delano, realizing that, hey, you know, I realized we got shafted. <laughs> There's nothing going to be anything about the Filipino uh, community in our history in Delano. We're going directly to the UFW headquarters <laughs> to there. So uh, we get there, and uh, the whole program, and, and it's, it's a very contrived one, a very contrived. Nobody's talking about Eat Leong anymore. It's uh, it's the very superficial kind of the Filipino dances, the Filipino songs. Uh, nobody's talking about trade union <laughs> anymore. Nobody's talking about <laughs> Eat Leong and the communist and <laughs> you know unionist that he was. It's all about, uh, you know, trying to put a little bit of a face of Filipino presence. That's basically it. But it's not even Filipino, but it's not a, anything really to do about Filipino workers and working class history. That was, that, that was the hurtful part to me. But anyway, I did attempt to try to speak to other people. And in doing so, it got back, I think, to the... Uh, to the UFW uh, folks <laughs> that were there. And um, as I was sitting with the others, um, Robin... You had a table was, up. Yes, I, we had a table. The Filipino farmers, we had our table, and we were waiting uh, for, you know, for the luncheon, to, for the food to be served. And, um, and I get approached first by uh, Roger uh, Gadiano. Now, Roger has a very, like many Filipinos who don't understand working class struggle and a Marxist perspective, he, he thinks that this is a civil rights movement. Uh, you know, he puts the 1965 Great Strike as a civil rights movement. Uh, and, and you have to, you know, and I'll say right now, no, the 1965 Great Strike had nothing to do with constitutional rights. It's not a civil rights movement. It was a workers' <laughs> movement, right? A strike action has nothing to do with, with the Constitution. And how do you know that? Because when the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights were written, it had nothing to do with, uh, there was no consideration of what workers' rights were. There's nothing in those documents that talk about what workers' rights are, right? So this is not about civil rights. This is about workers' rights. So let's put away that that very false narrative that Delano was the Filipino Selma. No, mm -mm. had nothing to do with uh, civil rights. Okay. The second thing. So, like I said, uh, 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 you know. Um, it's very, it's very a painful thing about Filipino history, but as they say, you know, the oppressor is strong and remains strong as long as he has accomplices within our midst. And unfortunately, what I can see now is um, that the UFW is very much one of those accomplices. It works with the Democratic Party. Uh, promoting the false illusion among workers that we can make, we can get social justice under capitalism. I mean, that's like telling slaves under slavery on a cotton plantation that you're going to get, you're going to get social justice, you're going to get freedom under slavery. <laughs> well, uh, let's be very clear. There is no social justice under capitalism for workers. Uh, capitalism is... In, uh, exploitation is inherent, right? Uh, so there would be no capitalism without the exploitation of workers and the oppression of the working class, right? So 
But as I was saying, that's a narrative that 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 uh, the Chavez faction, the UFW, are never going to speak to is class struggle. All right. So um, as I mentioned. Um, as, as the Filipino Farmers Cooperative, as we were sitting waiting to eat, uh, Robin Rodriguez, who's a professor with UC Davis and with the Bulasan Center, comes over with about six other people, including Glenn Aquino. And they try to uh, isolate me by saying, oh, Mary Jane, can we talk to you over here? <laughs> I said, no, whatever you have to say, you can say right here. No, we'd like to speak to you in private. No, this is a public event. There's not I don't you know, I don't have issues of privacy. <laughs> I don't have any privacy issues. Whatever you have to say, let's say it now. Okay? Well, what they basically had to say was get out, Mary Jane. <laughs> we don't like your we don't like your version of history. <laughs> we want you to leave. And what did they accuse you of doing? Soliciting. You know, I said soliciting. What? <laughs> and when the other farmers heard that, they just like jumped up and said, soliciting. Well, what? We can sell our vegetables? What are you, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, I mean, but I understood that that was just their rationale to try to get me out. They don't want a left wing. They don't want a communist perspective, a Marxist perspective on the agricultural history in this country. They don't want that at all. And so, you know, I, I even wonder in the Bulasan Center whether they talk about Carlos Bulasan being, um, you know, one of the, the foremost Filipino communists. You know, I bet they omit that. Just as they omit that Eat Leong and Chris Mansalves and all the others, Filipino leadership, leadership were Marxists, were communists. And, and Robin Rodriguez, in her presentation mm -hmm. about the history of Larry Itliong at the Poplar event, uh -huh. failed to mention, did not mention that Larry Itliong was a communist. Oh, and I doubt if she ever will. I mean, as long as she still grovels and in, in talking about beloved Cesar Chavez and beloved Dolores Huerta, the very people that pushed the Filipinos out of the UFW, I mean, are you clear about our history? Uh, have you, it's, you know, sometimes I get reminded uh, of a child. They remember their, ch their, their parents' happy marriage. They don't want to recount the divorce, the very painful, difficult, acrimonious divorce. And that is what happened. Okay. We got iced out. Not only, not because we're Filipinos, let's be very clear about that, but because we're trade unionists and we're communists. And, oh no, in the words of Mark Grossman, we don't want commie freaks in the UFW. And that's exactly why we were pushed out. So let's stop the very superficial, uh, you know, uh, narrative that it's because we were Filipinos. No. It's because what type of Filipinos we were. We were militant trade unionists. We were communists. We were Marxists. We were socialists. And that's why Chavez and Huerta, they could not abide by that at all, because they're not. They're not trade unionists. They don't come out of that strong and long tradition of the CIO and the CPUSA. They came out of the Catholic Church and the CSO and that uh, other style. <laughs> uh, but uh, one day, like I said, is uh, as the true history comes out, um, and I think the time is now. I mean, you know, how long can the, an agricultural sector of a nation remain unorganized, remain non-unionized? Uh, it, ha it, it has to occur. It's just part of the, the development of history in this country because agribusiness is really at, at its apex in its development. I read agricultural reports uh, quite a bit, and anybody who knows anything about agribusiness today knows of the three counties. This is the amazing thing. 
of the uh, there are three counties for the entire United States that does nearly 40% of all the agricultural production output, right? Those three counties, of course, are in the Central Valley. They are Fresno County, they are Tulare County, and there are the and, uh, Ke- and Kern, Kern, Kern County, okay. those three counties. And um, they're not doing well. They're doing extraordinarily well. They are posting historic levels of profit, uh, billions of profit. Uh, So when you look at uh, Tulare County, and uh, agribusiness is somewhere like maybe 12 billion of dollars a year, right? Right. And then you look at the workers. The workers in Tulare County are the poorest per capita for the entire state of California. Now, I'd like to know, I'd like any Democrat to explain to me how that inequity, that deep inequity uh, survives. Well, I'll tell you one thing. It survives because workers don't have union, a union. That's why. Okay. They have no uh, they have no organization that brings them together collectively in order to use those tools and those instruments to fight the capitalists, to do work stoppages. And Filipinos were very, very known for work stoppages, for uh, for uh, slowing down uh, work on the production, you know, and for strikes. I mean, that's what Filipino workers were known for, for strikes, right? And uh, if you look at photos of the, of the asparagus strike, you know, that was the biggest agricultural strike after World War II. And, and Itliong was there. So if Huerta can tell me that she organized Larry Itliong, <laughs> I'd like her to pull up some, <laughs> some historical <laughs> data about that. Uh, it, it's just so outrageous that she would say that. But what's more outrageous is nobody confronted her. Nobody. Uh, she has become almost, I guess, a saint, like St. Teresa, that nobody questions what comes out of her mouth. Uh, and she's become such an icon, especially to the Democratic Party and the liberal community, that they can't, uh, they can't uh, even um, uh, critically uh, assess what she's saying and what the narrative uh, that she's promoting. What is that historical narrative? Uh, but, I, uh, you know, in the end, um, I think what we'll see is that the workers will have a choice uh, soon, as they begin, as as the union movement uh, gravitate uh, begins to build up again. Are they going to go down the path of the UFW and the in the Chavez faction again? Well, I think that they'll see where it's going to lead them. Or are they going to uh, revive the tradition of uh, Itliong and? Um, and Ben Gimes and Pete Velasco and the true uh, trade unionists within the U.S. agricultural sector. Is that the path? And I think that that's the path that they'll choose. And uh, that the days of the UFW um, are, you know, I mean, it is over. It doesn't exist as, as a union anyway. It's a workers' organization.